Hey guys, I am Eric and this is The Existential Nerd. So welcome to today's episode. As you can see, I'm on the couch. There are no guests this week, but don't worry, we have plenty of guests lined up or being lined up over the course of the next few episodes, so stay tuned. This episode is going to be our, well, get ready for it, spoiler alert episode of Star Wars The Force Awakens. We're going to discuss some finer points and a little bit of a review of the film itself. So let's go ahead and just jump right into it and get started. So we got to go see the Star Wars film, the family and I, uh, back on the weekend it got released. It was great. Now, um... Personally, as a Star Wars fan who grew up on the, sh uh, uh, the the franchise, I've seen a lot of Star Wars. The only thing I honestly think I have not seen is the old Star Wars Holiday Special. Kind of been holding out on that one. Can you blame me? So anyway, the big deal about this whole franchise is it's pretty straightforward. There, there's some hidden plot points here and there that you know pop out in the next film or two, you know, so on and so forth. However, um, you know, some things were kind of messed up. You know, episodes one, two, and three, the prequel tril trilogy, just really didn't have much in the way of surprises. It was bogged down with a lot of exposition and a lot of political jargon. It just, it was not the kind of Star Wars film Star Wars fans wanted to see, even though it obviously was the kind of film that George Lucas wanted to make. Well, it, you know, we all can argue that it's his movies and he can do what he wants, but at the same time, you're making movies for people to watch and enjoy and then come back for more. You kind of stop making things like that for yourself once it becomes something the masses enjoy. Um, it's the way it is. So, the new movie, The Force Awakens, redeemed the franchise. There was just enough information released regarding the politics and what was going on in the universe or the galaxy at that time, ranging between the First Order, which was the remnants of the Galactic Empire, stuck in a small corner pocket of the galaxy itself, whereas the rest of the galaxy was under the rule of the New Republic. Now, of course, there was resistance members. They are the New Rebellion to be specific, the resistance. Um, their job was the same as the rebellion where they were fighting against the First Order, trying to uh, exact their peace and love across their pocket and then become part of the Galactic Republic. And there was also information regarding the fact that the Republic and the resistance were talking and working together to do this. So it wasn't a surprise that the resistance existed. Oh no, it was pretty much dead on solid. Um, the First Order was building a weapon that would be able to strike out against the Resistance and against the Rebellion when ready. And at that, at the point it was, it was pretty much ready. Even though there's a little science issue that I have with their giant star killer weapon. Um, so let's go ahead. First off, the story, like I said, was pretty well smooth. I mean, there was a couple spots that maybe could have been a little bit better, but J.J. Abrams stayed away from long exposition on a lot of context and left a lot of it to the visual elements of it all, along with the background inf uh, talking and information going on as well, especially in the flashback sequences that popped up here and there. Um, there's still plenty of mystery regarding who exactly is Ray's parents, even though I have some speculation. We'll go into that in a little bit. And we also are introduced to the new uh, uh, Sith baddie, which is Kylo Ren, which we find out who his parents are about halfway or towards the end of the film, even though it's pretty obvious, we kind of get it. Um, and we also have the new bad guy behind the scenes, the wizard behind the curtain, so to speak, in the uh, form of Snoke, which there is a fan theory going around that I am going to just lambaste here shortly. And if you've already read it, it's over on ericshoots.com, the existential nerd, where I discuss how Vader is not Snoke or Snoke is not Vader, depending on how you want to go with that. I'm going to bring that up real quick and... Uh, this way it's ready for us. So anyway, who is Rey? Rey is this enigmatic character that we don't know anything about. She's introduced early in the film, much in the way the same, like, there, here's the parallel. Uh, before I get too far, let, let me backtrack a little bit. The Force Awakens kind of rolls along the same way A New Hope 
rolled along with many of the same parallels going on between how they introduced stuff. Um, in, the, in New Hope, the bad guys are introduced attacking a rebel uh, spaceship and taking somebody important prisoner and information is ejected and gotten to somebody important that needs it. Well, in The Force Awakens, it starts exactly the same, uh, except instead of uh, in space on spaceships, it's on a planet where the uh, First uh, Order is attacking a resistance base where a prominent character later on in the show is given important information who and then puts it inside of BB-8 and the same thing pr uh, flows along. Now and again the, the parallels continue where we're introduced to Rey who is doing her um, almost hermit-like life thing gathering junk and selling it um, at the local uh, uh, community bizarre thing and stumbles across BB-8 who tells her about his its great mission and she's just kind of like oh you mean that and I thought that was a legend or a myth in this case you know like Luke Skywalker the resistance and change that out with Obi-Wan uh, so again, yes, lots of parallels. Even Starkiller, the, the massive weapon the First Order has, is basically a supersized star, uh, Death Star. Literally, it is. So but we're not going to go into depth regarding the parallels because it doesn't really matter. Because even though a lot of people are complaining that, oh, J.J. Abrams cheated, he just made a copy, he just redid A New Hope. Well, you got a choice, folks. We either get The Force Awakens, which was a, a very fun and exciting film that was great, or we get, you know, episode one. Again. No. I don't think so. Not at all. So, again, um, Disney and J.J. Abrams really did handle it all well, but let's go back to who is Ray. Ray is this character we don't know anything about at the beginning of the film. We don't know the backstory. We don't know anything about this girl other than she has a hermit life collecting scrap metal, selling it at the uh, facility to get money. So, but as the story uh, goes on, we realize she's force sensitive, actually very force sensitive, like strong in the force kind of thing, which leads the idea that she might be related to some prominent characters. Uh, even the way her story is uh, un unfolding before us, it leads to the fact that she is a Skywalker in some form or fashion. You're led to believe that, oh, she's a uh, Han and Leia kid, because we find out later, no, you know, here's a you know, big thing, Kylo Ren is a Solo, Ben Solo to be specific. Um, really not much else, and he's, you know, we'll get it, like I said, get into him later. So we're leading along thinking, oh, Ray, she's like the twin sister, blah, blah, blah. Then she's captured, and then we realize that Ben is, you know, Ben would be, uh, is older than her and goes like, you don't know her. Who are you? Kind of thing. So there goes the theory that, oh, they're brother and sister bringing force or balance to the force, you know, siblings, blah, blah, blah. They're going to the EU and borrowing some elements. Cool. No, they're not. So who is she? Well, we continue going along, hoping that maybe uh, Luke is going to be introducing the story before way at the end and, you know, pop some information. Then we have a flashback that the uh, Anakin's old lightsaber, which became Luke's, who, you know, wham, there goes his hand, ah, the Bespin things and stuff. And somehow um, it's found by that one particular character. I don't have her name up right now. And she found it. How she found it, who knows, who cares? has it in a box, it's calling to Ray. it's Vader's essentially, and you can feel the evil, but you can also feel the good inside of it, because Luke's goodness is in the saber hilt and stuff, and Ray's terrified by it because of all the things she sees, and not just the past stuff, but the future stuff, but not much future stuff. And when I say future stuff, I should clarify more on the lines of what was going on in the last 30 years. Um, not necessarily her future. And if it did, we didn't see it. Um, but it terrified her. It scared her. She didn't understand it. She doesn't realize she's Force-sensitive, even though it's, the brain is clicking, going, Oh, crap, I'm Force-sensitive. I'm one of those stories in the legends. Oh, my gosh. But 
Then we get to the ending of the film. We're still left with the question, who is Ray? And she's handing Luke in a completely non-talking conversation about, hey, Dad, I'm here. Yes, I'm speculating Ray is Luke Skywalker's father. Keep in mind, where she goes uh, is this one uh, planet. It was speculated that it was an extended universe planet, which was in some of the uh, Force Awakens related merchandise that was sold prior to the film. Um, has now got a different name kind of thing. I don't know how it's all play, uh, playing out. Uh, my research really didn't lead me anywhere. Anyway, let's assume that this planet it, it is one of the extended universe planets because of the fact that he's at the first Jedi Temple, which is considered canon at this point because it has been officially released by Disney and the Star Wars camp, so on and so forth. Um, where he's standing is interesting though if you pay attention i wish i could find a good picture for you but i can't and i am not uh, going to illegally download this film so i can't make a picture luke is standing over something and he's not necessarily just standing over looking out into the ocean or into the horizon no he's got this crossed armed thing in front of him standing there looking down at the ground what is he looking at? If you notice, there's a little bit of a mound there. Not a huge mound, but a little mound with a rock sticking up kind of like this at an angle, maybe off to the side of hair. And it's a flat rock. One side of it is flat, but you can't see anything on it. It just looks like a weirdly shaped rock from the distance. And they never focus on it in the end of the film, which leads my speculation that it is a gravesite. But whose grave? Is it Anakin's? Possibly. But I doubt it. I believe it possibly could be the remains of a wife. I speculate at one point during the 30 years between Return of the Jedi and A Force Awakens, because keep in mind, folks, all the extended universe material is considered legend material. Um, it's not official canon. It's not even pseudo canon. However, I do speculate that uh, Disney and the Star Wars camp are going to be using extended universe uh, content in some form or fashion, recycling in it, uh, recycling old material into new material, um, removing the context that it was originally in, and putting it over here in a way that they can use it. You know, why not? There's so much material in the extended universe; it makes sense. <coughs> I'm speculating. <coughs> excuse me, folks. That the grave belongs to a certain character named Mara Jade. Mara Jade is one of the most popular extended universe characters ever um, she is a she was a protege of the emperor her character was essentially his private assassin while vader was the face of the empire essentially and his number one go-to guy he liked to make sure he had a backup plan you know because why not he's the emperor and screw the rule of two um, he decides to have this, but of course keep in mind in the extended universe with like the Star Wars Unleashed games, Vader had a protege, Starkiller. So anyway, well, irrelevant. Mara Jade, then after the fall of the Empire, becomes independent. She does her own thing, but she's out to kill Luke through her early, uh, uh, you know, appearances. Because, well, damn him, he killed my daddy figure but as time goes on she opens up to him he opens up to her and they fall in love and they get married and things happen what if the star wars extended universe has been recycled at some point into this new star wars canon universe where luke got married to mara jade i like the idea i love the idea and they had a child being ray now we don't get to meet Mara in any of the current stuff because well she's already dead but doesn't mean we can't see her in some form or fashion in future comic books or novels that tie up what happened in the last 30 years there's now this huge gap just like when we watched the original trilogy a uh, new hope we're talked we're told about the clone wars and had no clue what it was but we didn't get to know what it was until like 20 or 30 years later when the new prequel trilogy was released introducing us to the Clone Wars. So, 
there's always this possibility that there's this 30 year gap we're going to learn stuff especially about another character we're going to talk about Snoke well let's go on with Kylo Ren because like I said Ray's done now at this point I think Luke is the father and she is key to the balance of the force and it's going to be important she's going to have a very big role let's just hope she doesn't lose a hand Kylo Ren, or Ben Solo, is an interesting character. Everybody's calling him a whiny emo brat who's doing this and that. No, he's not. Well, yes, he is. He is whiny. He's just like his grandfather was, you know, from the prequel trilogy. You know, Anakin was pretty whiny. He was kind of a... Um, I'll just let you put whatever word you want into that sentence right there. Um... But he was the most powerful force user in the universe. Not just the galaxy, the universe. Until he meets Rey, of course, which we believe may be more powerful than he is because he wasn't even able to go into her head, which was like a cakewalk for him on everybody else. Interesting. But keep in mind, he was so powerful, he did things that Vader couldn't do or Palpatine couldn't even do. Stopping a laser bolt mid-flight. And it just sat there. Just boom. And then walks away. Doesn't even give it a second thought. And boom. Boom. What the hell? He's powerful. He gets shot by Chewie's bowcaster, which throughout the film is being demonstrated as one of the most bad weapons in the Star Wars universe at this time. It's shooting people, sending them flying backwards. Making him flip head over heel backwards. It's putting holes in things. And Kylo walks it off. Walks it off. And continues to do a huge battle with a lightsaber against somebody who is an inept force user and somebody who was the janitor on Starkiller Base. Who's holding his own pretty well. They're not kicking his ass. Keep in mind, he's got a, bla- a, a bowcaster blaster wound that hurts bad. Kylo is not weak, and Snoke knows this. Snoke is manipulating him, especially this this glorification of Vader, this uh, putting his grandfather on this pedestal and worshiping him. Now, why is Snoke feeding into this has led to some speculation. Everybody thinks that Snoke could be pushing this worship thing into a position of what drives Kylo because Snoke is Vader. No, he's not. If you read my article over at ericshoots.com, the existential nerd, Vader's dead. Anakin is Vader. Vader is Anakin. Anakin, Vader, whatever, is dead. Dead. D E A D. Dead. Stick a fork in him. He's done. He's dead. Oh my God. Bury him. He's dead. Do I need to say dead anymore? Let's recap, shall we? Keep in mind, all Star Wars films are canon. Star Wars Clone Wars, the car, uh, animated CG cartoon series, is ca- canon. Star Wars Rebels is canon. To an extent, the uh, animation that was done by the same people behind Samurai Jack on Cartoon Network is technically canon because it leads directly into Episode 3. I don't care what anybody says, it has to be canon due to those facts. Anyway, at the end of Return of the Jedi, Vader dies on the Death Star. He basically is choking because everything's failing. His body's failing. The machines are failing. He was force electrocuted by the Emperor as the Emperor went tumbling down the shaft. So, Vader tells Luke, take this helmet off so I may see you for the first time with my own eyes. Of course, it's also his last time. Vader dies after a little exposition of redemption. Vader dies, Luke drags him up on the shuttle, they take off, they go to the moon of Endor, and obviously Luke takes some time to build a stack of wood for a funeral pyre. And Vader's body's thrown on it, and we're making s'mores. Vader's body is burnt. It is burning. It is 
ash. His physical fleshy parts are ash. If anything of the, of the biological part is left, it is bone. That is it, bone. Nothing else, just bone. As far as the helmet and the suit, the electronics and such, yes, the robotic parts are more likely going to be remnants, and that's it. Why is this important? Vader doesn't have a right hand. About from here. Remember the battle on, uh, uh, um, I want to say Musta uh, Mustafa, but I know that's not right. Mustafar. There we go. Mustafar. Obi-Wan cuts off his legs at the knees. Both of them. And he cuts off his right arm. More so than it was already. Because it was a robot arm that was cut off by Dooku! In episode two! That's right, folks. Snoke has two hands. Fleshy bitty hands. Look in the pictures. So, no. Vader, Anakin is not Snoke. Another reason why he's not, he died and was a force ghost standing beside Obi-Wan and Yoda at the end of Return of the Jedi. But the, that, that, was a, that was the extended edition uh, redos by Lucas that they did that scene. No, it's not. It was altered, yes, because they put in Hayden Christensen in that scene. But in the original movie that came out in the early 80s, 82, Three, four. It was the original actor. The guy who we saw without the mask. Actor number three-ish. Technically, you might not say three-ish because there's four people who plays Anakin slash Darth Vader. Um, the guy in the actual suit. James Earl Jones, the voice. The dude without the helmet. And then, of course, Hayden Christensen. Anyway. That guy that was number three, the one without the helmet, is the one that's a force ghost in the original release of the film by Yoda and Obi-Wan. So no, folks, this ain't some extended edition version thing that didn't happen before, man. No, it did. Your argument about Snoke being Vader is invalid. It ain't happening. Read the article for more details. However, again, in the article, I do want to go on something regarding what I said earlier, kind of related with the whole extended universe being recycled and used in some portion in the new Star Wars universe canon. That being cloning technology used by the Emperor. Oh, by the way, go back real quick on Snoke. The, the scars and the stuff is completely out of place. If Disney can make Jeff Bridges look young and slap his face on somebody else's head... Or body they would have done this with Snoke if he was Anakin and then they would have completely blacked it out just like boom here he is just like this just the face or maybe just the mouth blah because they don't want to give it away they gave us a full frontal of his face like from here up of his face that's not Anakin and if it was a clone of some sort of Anakin or even just Anakin himself a body we're talking some serious burnage because when you left him at the end of Return of the Jedi smoking, there was smoke just billowing out of the face of the helmet badly, meaning that face got roasted big time, which would have made it look just... Freddy Krueger would have looked better, prettier than what this dude was going to look like. So Snoke is not, is not Vader. Not possible. And if you cloned him and still was Vader... The scars and everything would not happen because consider clones, you start with Django Fett, who was the original clone, or the blueprint, the, the template for all the clone troopers. Any scars or injuries he would have gotten after or even during or before the genetic information was taken from him, the genetic information is going to go on a baseline of what he would look like if he was perfect you know no scars no broken bones nothing and every clone therefore would also replicate that appearance and that body without the scars and the broken tissue and everything even if he was to like I said get a broken bone or some scars before the cloning process started it wouldn't matter because they would look like Django Fett without the scars da, 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 da. so therefore Anakin if he was a clone or Vader was a clone he would not have those scars 
So, who is Snoke? We got two options left. Option number one is Snoke is just Snoke. He's a new bad guy, which is what Andy Serkis and a few others are saying. Snoke is just that. He is the new bad guy. He is like the Emperor. Nobody that's specifically related to anybody in the Star Wars canon, but through happenstance and, you know, acquaintance. In this case, Kylo. He's just somebody who, you know, exists in the Star Wars canon. However, I like the idea that what if, for a moment, the extended universe stuff happens as far as like, I like this, let's use that. The clone of Emperor Palpatine is a strong possibility. In Dark Empire 1, 2, and Empires in the Emperor uses the old Clone Wars technology, which is no longer being ran by the uh, the aliens, the Chameleons, or sorry, I'm butchering it. I should really write these things down when I do these videos, but I'm not going to because it's just, yeah, not my style. Yeah. The heck with professionalism. Anyway, the technology is no longer used in the original trilogy for many reasons. One, you now have a galaxy under thumb with the Empire that could literally uh, go out and force recruitment. You know, make people join, has conscripts, uh, all that stuff. So they won't need to clone anybody. It's cheaper to go and just, you're signing up for else, rather than spending millions of credits per soldier. You gotta remember, when Obi-Wan went to the facility to inspect the clone army, you know, investigating what was going on, he comes to find out it's a very expensive ordeal and the taxpayers are of the uh, uh, Galactic Republic are paying for it. And it blew his mind how expensive it was. It blew everybody's mind how expensive it was, but it was useful and, you know, the Jedi were dumb um, people and used them. Look how that turned out. And that's probably another reason why the Emperor doesn't want to use them, because somebody could plant something in these clones' uh, mind to turn on him, and, well, there goes his plans of galactic domination. Well, in this case, he creates a army of himself, but all of them are mindless bodies. They have a brain, mind you, but there's nothing in there. And they only are released from their tanks upon the need of the host. In this case, it's something that uh, Palpatine learned from Darth Plagueis, the ability to force ghost himself into practically another living body, meaning that he doesn't exist. However, that could also mean that Snoke is uh, 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 um, Darth Plagueis. However, we're pretty solid on the idea that Plagueis is dead. Plagueis doesn't exist. Maybe Plagueis had all the information and Palpatine understood what was going on and knew what needed to be done, but the technology wasn't perfected necessarily. So yes, uh, Plagueis could force ghost, but there was nowhere to force ghost to. And using the dark side of the force himself, Palpatine could have entrapped him and caused him to literally just die. That was it. Done. So Palpatine, though, now understands how it works, knows the cloning process, integrates the cloning process into his necessities, and now creates clones. But why is Plague or why is uh, Snoke so horrid looking? Well, again, we could fill in gaps over the next 30 years from Return of the Jedi to these events on why he looks the way he does, such as maybe conflicts and such. But I like something that I posted on the website regarding the fact that the clones can't handle the force power that Palpatine has. Because every time Palpatine force ghosts, he becomes a little bit more powerful in the dark side. He is absorbed into it, but he uh, is able to retain himself, his consciousness, and at the same time absorb and draw more of the dark side of the force into himself, and then goes into a new body, and that body deteriorates quickly. How quickly, they don't really specify, but we're going to assume he probably needs one every few months to a year or so. That is a lot of clone bodies, and in the comic books, there was a lot. And these are Dark Horse comics, and they're also novels. Look them up. Look for them. Marvel is re-releasing them as the Star Wars Legends series, Dark Empire 1, 2, and The Empire's End. Wonderful books. 
lots of intrigue, lots of wonderful story. Do not count out the extended universe just because Disney said so. Because I really think there's a lot of elements coming in. Now, like I said, I love this idea that Snoke is Palpatine and Palpatine's just using the name Snoke to hide, you know, maybe like smoke and mirrors. Um, another reason why I think he might be Palpatine is the love of the giant face. Every hologram Palpatine tends to use has a monstrous version of himself representing his ego. Snoke, every time we saw him, was with a massive, massive hologram. There's so many parallels here that make sense, but I'm not ruling out the possibility that Snoke could be nothing more than a Palpatine admirer himself and is driving Anakin, or sorry, Kylo. And you know, the strong possibility also is Snoke might not even have force powers. We don't even see him using them. And we know that if Snoke was PO'd at anybody, he could have used the force on that person. Vader did it numerous times just through uh, video chat. How many uh, admirals did he go through just by like, hey, you screwed up, you're dead, done. It's possible, but I don't think Snoke had that ability. So it's either the body was dying and the, using the force every time killed him just a little bit more and Palpatine needed a new body, or Snoke just is a little more lenient? I don't know. So, those are some theories, and also some spoilers, so I do, if you haven't seen Star Wars, uh, The Force Awakens by now, and you're still avoiding spoilers, alright, you've, yeah, I've, it's been almost a month. Almost a month. It's only made a billion and a half dollars already. Whatever, don't complain. Seriously, don't. You could steal it off the internet right now if you didn't want to do spoilers. I don't care. Go watch it! So guys, like I said, excellent, excellent film. The special effects were amazing. I almost cried after when I heard the opening theme and it just, I was sucked back to childhood. I did it for the original, the new trilogy too, the prequels, but once I started watching the film, it just didn't feel the same. And But this one, it I was just edging my seat, constantly going, oh my gosh. And I was like, <gasps> I was constantly surprised every turn. I loved the film, and it was worth every moment. So please, if you haven't seen it, go see it, please, now. So guys, that wraps up this issue of The Existential Nerd. Now, like I said, we do have intent of uh, some special guests coming soon. I'm still negotiating a few of them, and we're hoping to get some other stuff going on. Um, I do hope you enjoyed this episode. Please, on our comments below here on YouTube, or over on Facebook, or over on Google+, or on our website and Twitter, let us know what you thought. Give us your feedback. Tell us, please. We like it. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel over at youtube.com slash notes and nerds because your subscriptions, they're free for you and mean everything to us. So guys, thank you for watching and tune in next time to The Existential Nerd.